advise that the proposed payments remain open for examination. Minister, did you wish to make an opening statement in regards to the portfolio of administered items? Uh, I don't propose to. I'll just indicate that um, we've had some personnel change and I'm joined at the table by Professor Martin Westwell, who's the Chief Executive of the SACE Board, and SACE is usually the uh, uh, dominant part, but not the only part of administered items, so I think we'll deal with SACE questions first, if that's uh, acceptable. Uh, and then other administered items i will be supported by Peter Smith, Dr Peter Smith, who's the Executive Director of Strategic Policy and External Relations, uh, Chris Bernardi, the Chief Financial Officer, and Ben Templey, uh, the Chief Operating Officer. And I got an SMS from the former Chief Operating Officer Officer uh, Julianne Reacher during the break, who says that the words I put into her mouth were correct. Yeah, very good. Uh, Member Farrat, did you wish to make an opening statement? Yeah. Very disappointing. <laughs> uh, Member Farrat, would you like to open with some questions? Thank you, Chair, and welcome, um, Professor. Um, perhaps you could use this opportunity. I'm happy to provide a bu budget reference, page 177 in the workforce summary, but. Um, uh, Minister or, or Professor, to talk about what the effect of COVID has been on the SACE board over the last 12 months and its operations and what challenges that has presented to you. Uh, look, I thank the member for the question and I think I'll give uh, Professor Westwell the opportunity to uh, reflect. I think that's what the question was seeking. I think it's fair to say that schools have had uh, lots of challenges over the last 12 months um, in dealing with their disruption due to COVID. But I would say that uh, the SACE board and the sectors and the schools have actually worked really well together to use the flexibility within the SACE. Um, the SACE board pivoted and our staff engaged with teachers in every subject uh, last year to ask the teachers what flexibility would they need to be able to continue the learning for students without compromising on the standard. And so. Uh, schools changed their programs around, became a little bit more flexible, used a lot of the flexibility that already existed in the SACE, but where uh, it was required, we reduced some of the assessment items, changed some of the assessment uh, requirements so that schools could continue their programs and to be successful. This year, that's not been necessary so far, but of course, we're absolutely ready to do that same kind of pivot and to add extra flexibility should uh, schools need it throughout the rest of the year. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for that answer. Professor, Minister, through, through you, um, have the restrictions that have been put in place around the world really due to the spread of COVID um, restricted also um, your, your efforts and the SACE Board's ongoing efforts for, for many years to encourage other jurisdictions overseas to adopt our SACE? Or how has progress on that front gone given the challenges that you've faced? Similar sorts of challenges, in fact, probably in some of our schools in, uh, that do the SACE in uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, Pacific Islands and China, um, they've seen lockdowns for longer with more profound uh, restrictions to the way in which they can do their programs. And again, we've offered them just the same sorts of flexibilities we would for our domestic students. Um, in terms of the SACE International program and the uh, recruitment of students and in fact the development of the program in some of those jurisdictions it's that's certainly been quite challenging so in terms of the uh, numbers of students that we we would have hoped to have had in the program they've reduced we've the program is still really vibrant and um, we've just appointed a new director of SACE International and so looking at some of the diversification um, of that program and moving into other markets. So we think we've got a really strong platform upon which to build. Uh, schools have had that disruption, but we've been supportive and students have still managed to be successful through the SACE. And, and in fact, enrolling uh, still in universities in Australia and South Australia and being taught remotely. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Professor. Um, on uh, page 177, and uh, workforce summary, and in particular for the SACE board, I see a FTE reduction there. Um, through you, Minister, I'm wondering whether Professor Westwood could explain to us the, the reason for that uh, reduction. I think it's 120.5 down to 110.5, if I read it correctly.
Uh, I understand that there was a realignment of ICT agency staff, uh, but that it is actually since been an update since the budget papers were identified, they're going to be reclassified as employees. And so, pardon me, effectively what, rather than there being a drop from 120 to 110, as I understand it, that 120 will remain at 120. Thank you, Minister. Uh, and through you again, Minister, on the same, well, actually, probably not the same um, um, budget line, but uh, we spoke earlier in uh, school education about what's happening in New South Wales with their uh, preparedness to get Year 12s vaccinated so that it doesn't affect their final year of, of their studies. Is there any work perhaps that the SACE board is doing uh, early preparation around how that could be facilitated amongst SACE students here in South Australia, if the need arose? That's not something the SACE board has been involved with. Thank you, Chair. Um, given that we have just gone into a lockdown and, and now thankfully come out of that, but the, the spectre of a lockdown is always sort of around the corner somewhat, um, what, what work is the SACE board doing or has done, I guess, to uh, have contingencies in place should face-to-face -face examinations not be possible? this year or next? So just as last year, our focus has been uh, working with schools to continue the learning. We know that's what students really need to be able to move on and be successful in their future. Um, we are prepared, uh, should the situation require it, to be flexible in terms of some of our requirements. And of course, it depends on when the, the disruption occurs, uh, different times of the year has a different impact on the program. So at the moment, uh, should there be a, a, a broader, deeper uh, uh, disruption, then we can add more flexibility. So that might be about reducing some of the assessment uh, task requirements, uh, changing the nature of some of the assessments, some of the assessments that might need to be done in a laboratory or on camp outdoor education or something like that, changing the, the requirements of those so that schools can still do them as fully as they possibly can. Um, so we're staying really connected with the community, finding out what their needs are and seeing um, uh, uh, how we might be flexible. There's lots, of, as I said before, there's lots of flexibility already in the SACE. And what we found last year was that for lots of uh, schools, uh, they might use the SACE in a particular way but even within the requirements of the SACE, they could change their program and still carry on and get the students to be successful. Now, of course, as we get closer to the end of the year, if it was in, a, in exams or something like that, then we'd have to have a, a different way of responding. And, but we've got uh, a number of different contingencies in place to be able to respond exactly as the moment requires and as our schools require. Minister, uh, just to go back just a, a step to uh, my earlier question to the professor through you about the impact that not being able to travel overseas has had on uh, the SACE board's efforts to encourage other jurisdictions to adopt our wonderful SACE. Um, perhaps separate to the, the question of how COVID has affected those efforts, have we made any gains in terms of convincing other jurisdictions to, to adopt SACE? So we're still operating within the uh, within the countries, within the markets that we we're operating. As I said, um, we had hoped to have diversified that a little bit more at the moment, and we've not been able to do that work to enter into other markets um, during, uh, uh, during the COVID and the restrictions that have been there, though we are planning for that um, right now. Um, the number of schools that we have been, um, that we're engaged in, so now the number of schools has grown from seven to 28 schools over that last uh, five years. Um, and we've got 26 schools in five different countries delivering the SACE. And there were two scheduled to start delivering 22, 23. Now we had hoped that those schools would have started earlier, but they've not been able to recruit students. And, though, and so there's a delay associated um, with that. So certainly the COVID has had a, a, an impact. Some of our schools in China uh, we're not sure if they're going to um, uh, renew some of their contracts. And that's a little bit about the political situation and the advice that those schools are getting. 
Um, so, as I said before, the, the SACE International Programme, I think, is still really vibrant. We have got some of those challenges. But, but what we're seeing is, is as a pause. I don't think it's a, um, a fundamental change in the SACE International Structure. In fact, one of the things that we've seen is that some of our local schools who are delivering um, internationally and remotely, uh, that's a new business model for them. And so that's a kind of new business model for the SAIS board as well. How do we provide our, intell our intellectual property to some of those business arrangements but it's doing, being done remotely from Australia into some of those countries? So I think, in fact, what we're seeing is some new opportunities as well as some restrictions on the existing opportunities. I think I have any further questions on the SAIS component, Minister? anyone decides to come back with further safe questions. I uh, welcome Dr. Smith uh, to the table. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just, I, th I should perhaps check first, Minister, but are we in the right uh, part of today's proceedings for questions regarding the um, Education Standards Board? Yep, okay. Uh, I might ask uh, page 24 to 25 of Budget Paper 5, if you, if you need a reference, but how are we tracking in terms of the um, assessments that are made of our services and the work that the Education Standards Board does. And um, perhaps rather than me spend five minutes finding the exact detail if I start, and uh, hopefully we'll capture what you're after, and I'm sure you'll ask a supplementary if I've missed this and I can take it on notice at that time. So uh, the Board is supported... Um, by a secretariat comprising of 40 employees, both ongoing public service employees and a number employed on contracts to undertake its functions. Recurrent funding from the South Australian Government is approximately $3.9 million to fulfil its obligations, and the Department for Education provides supplementary funding of, about one, of approximately $1.1 million uh, with CPI increases to compensate for the withdrawal from the National Partnership Agreement funding by the Commonwealth in 2018. Uh, we also funded $450,000 carried over the 2021 financial year for costs associated with the office accommodation fit-out at Grenfell Street. The board regulates 1,346 early childhood education and care services uh, in South Australia across metropolitan, rural and remote locations. As at the 4th of June this year, there were 431 approved providers with 369 operating a single service. There were 1,226 services approved to provide education and care under the national law. There were 120 residual services comprised of in-home care, rural and mobile care and occasional care services. These services are regulated under a modified version of the national law. I think this is probably the most important part of what the member was getting at. As at the 4th of June 2021, 96% of eligible services in South Australia have been assessed and rated. And uh, let the member do his own maths on what 96% of 1,346 is. Um, and I'm sure that he'll get about the right answer. The board is responsible also for the registration and review of registration of all government and non-government schools. As at the 7th of June, there were 726 schools registered in South Australia, being 513 government schools, 109 independent and 104 Catholic schools. The board is also responsible for the endorsement of schools for registration on CRICOS, the Commonwealth Register of Institutions and Courses for overseas students. As at the 7th of June, 176 schools offered education to overseas full fee paying students, they being 141 government schools managed through the Improved Provider International Education Services and 35 non-government schools. I think I should probably, given the amount of attention I've given Julianne Reedstra, I should also wish cheerio to Marilyn Sleeth, the former director in that area, who served both governments, uh, both persuasions yeah. very well for many years in providing an incredibly effective international education service which well and truly punches above its weight uh, for all government systems around Australia. Marilyn has also uh, retired and uh, uh, Julianne and Marilyn had uh, retirement functions in recent times which um, multiple ministers were at. Um, endorsement on CRICOS is for a seven year period. That probably covers what the member's after. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Chair, on the same um, uh, budget paper five, page 24 to 25, and some questions around the um, non-government schools uh, grants. Uh, I think the grants for 
capital projects or upgrades. Uh, and, and I'd like to ask how many applications were received under this grant line in the past financial year and, if possible, which schools were successful and any that applied that were not successful. Thanks to the members for the question. Um, so uh, there's $11 million a year for infrastructure upgrades within non-government schools divided equally across the independent and the Catholic sectors. Uh, that, implement, that, that funding has been supplemented uh, in this year's budget and uh, uh, last year's budget as well as a result of a decision the government has made to effectively double that grant pool uh, given the impact of COVID. So the Catholic sector uh, and the independent sector have both received uh, 11.8 million dollars or thereabouts uh, as a CPI uh, that takes place. So it's two programs effectively because the Catholic sector uh, receives uh, the amount and then determines the funding. There's still an application process and I think that there's an approval but effectively Catholic Education SA determines the allocation of funds for its half of the program uh, and then each of the independent schools uh, are in the independent sector which is roughly the same size uh, gets an allocation effectively dependent on size. So uh, the Association of Independent Schools SA in relation to the independent sector uh, along with the department manage the distribution of capital funding to independent schools. Funding is based on a scale determined by enrolments and school SES scores. An assessment panel recommended 2021 grants totaling uh, hang on that should be right because there were the two I'll, I'll, the information, 2021 grants totalling $5.78 million exclusive GST to 89 independent schools. Uh, all 89 of those schools have received 2020 funding payments following execution of agreements. Um, the 2020-2021 uh, 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 has seen, uh, I think, 104 independent non-government schools participating and uh, those grants have been contracted and paid. And obviously we're now in the process of the 21 uh, 22, uh, which I would anticipate uh, all of those schools being able to receive grants with the unfortunate exception of Ainsbury, uh, which has uh, ceased its operations and indeed having been paid their last grant but not having spent it, uh, they have either returned or have indicated that they will return that grant to the department uh, and that grant that was going to Ainsbury from memory it was about sixty or seventy thousand uh, dollars will be available for uh, to be part of the pool for the next round in relation to the Catholic Education SA uh, for the Catholic sector uh, there were six grants to Catholic schools approved for the 2021 capital projects and uh, but those are all administered by the one agreement it's Catholic education that effectively determines it uh, so in relation to if there are any apart from the Ironsbury example if there are any schools that applied for grants under this program uh, that were not able to be paid I'm, I don't recall there being any uh, Dr Smith doesn't recall any uh, obviously if there's uh, further information we've missed we'll bring it back but I don't think I need to take it on notice I think that um, answers the question. Thank you, Minister. And on the same budget line again, have there been any changes made to the assessment criteria for these loans in the last financial year? Loans or grants? Oh, sorry, the grants. Well, it, may, it might help the member. I'll, uh, why don't I answer loans and grants? Um, because there have been some changes to the loans uh, criteria in relation to priority will be given to infrastructure projects for the SAFA loans. This is the non-government school loans that were under the previous government low interest loans. And as of last year's budget now, no interest loans for the first period with the pool uh, increased. So priority will be given to infrastructure projects that support increased enrolment capacity in geographic areas where there is demand, uh, student retention and the refurbishment of existing facilities to provide contemporary learning experiences. Uh, the uh, round one of the revised scheme uh, closed a few months ago. Uh, there were 15 applications and the assessment pr uh, process for those applications is currently underway. Uh, now, in relation to the grants program, uh, all independent schools can participate and uh, I don't believe we've made any change to the criteria in relation to uh, what they can apply for. 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your answer, Minister. Is there any chance you have the 15 schools which have applied under the SAFA loans? And if not, could you perhaps take that on notice? Uh, I'll take it on notice uh, only because uh, I just want to double check whether or not it's appropriate to provide information about the schools that have applied in case it's unreasonable for those that might potentially be unsuccessful. Uh, and certainly uh, in relation to any that are successful, uh, we will be keen to uh, advise the school and advise the community uh, as soon as humanly possible once that uh, SAFA process uh, is complete. For uh, the casual viewers of um, estimates, apart from Julian Reister, who would know this, uh, SAFA is the South Australian Australian Financing Authority. It comes under the Treasurer uh, and it's uh, obviously they don't report to me but uh, we have an input into, into their process. Thank you, Minister. Um, do you or have you received individual approaches from any members of Parliament regarding individual applications under either the SAFA loans program or the grants program? My answer is I don't think so, uh, and I don't think that any have jumped to Dr Smith's mind either. I don't recall so, uh, but I would hesitate. It, it's not impossible that someone's included a reference to something in a, in a letter somewhere, but it's certainly not something I'm aware of, and it's certainly in relation to the loans. I would um, reiterate that uh, they are assessed uh, by uh, relevant offers, uh, officers within SAFRA. I think that uh, a couple of people from Dr Smith's team may potentially be involved from the Education Department, but uh, I'm fairly certain that... Uh, well, I certainly take the view of personally uh, having a hands-off approach to it. I think that would be... Uh, uh, the, I think that's the right approach. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister. Um, my earlier question was around whether or not the assessment criteria for either of these programs has changed, and accept your answer on that. Has any representations been made to you by either of the um, uh, Independent Schools Association or Cuff Against South Australia about their desire for any other changes criteria-wise on either of these grant lines? I'd hesitate to say that there haven't been any changes over the period. I think there were some that I referred to last year, uh, and uh, I don't think they were significant. Uh, there were uh, a handful of schools that weren't eligible previously that, that are, all schools are, uh, are now eligible effectively now. Um, in terms of Catholic education, uh, it's a bit easier uh, also to, to be clear. Uh, they may well have changed criteria that they have internally applied, uh, but uh, I'm not uh, aware of that. Uh, but they have, um, g given that we uh, provide them with uh, effectively an allocation and leave it to them to determine how that allocation is spent, uh, I suspect they have an application process within Catholic education where schools indicate if they're interested uh, in having some support through this grant uh, and it's possible Catholic education have changed the way that they assess that, uh, but it's not something that uh, has, has come up. It's not something that's been brought to my attention. Uh, I'm satisfied for Catholic education to make those determinations under their own steam. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you for your answer, Minister. I think your uh, earlier answer suggested that there probably haven't been too many unsuccessful applications necessarily. I understand that. I'm generalising there. But in terms of whatever unsuccessful applications in any of the grant lines that there have been, are there any consistent reasons for them being knocked back? I mean, are we seeing something that might suggest there needs to be some tinkering with the criteria to allow what might be genuine and valuable projects to be approved under the grants lines? I think it's um, describing the... Uh, and, and I'll focus on the independent schools because I think I've explained uh, what the situation is with the Catholic schools. But in relation to the independent schools, uh, there's a formula effectively that works out what the notional allocation is for each school. So effectively, each of those schools in the independent sector is entitled to a grant, uh, and that grant size uh, depends on the factors that were described earlier. Effectively, the size of the school has an impact, the SES of the school has an impact on the size 
uh, of the grants. I think the special schools uh, potentially also receive a larger grant. There are two special schools in the independent sector uh, at St Eden and Aspect Treetops, as the member would recall. And uh, I think they get a, a, a larger grant than they would get if they were in the mainstream. Uh, the, uh, so that notional allocation of a certain amount of money for each school having been identified, uh, the school uh, then is required to submit uh, to the ASA and the department, the, the, the partnership that determines whether the grants are approved, a project for which they propose to spend that money. Uh, and I'm, I imagine that AISA uh, probably provides some support to those schools to understand uh, what would be eligible to spend that money on. Uh, and uh, uh, I, as, as I think I answered the member's question before, I don't think that there were any that were knocked back in the last year that we're aware of. If there are any systemic issues uh, that have come up that would suggest a tinkering with the criteria would be beneficial beyond what's been done in the past, uh, then I'll provide that answer separately to the member. But again, I don't think I need to take that on notice. I think that's probably provided the information the member requires. change of composition so I can recognise you. So I've got a request to be discharged by the member for Badco and a request to join the committee from uh, the member for Port Adelaide. So now that that's formally done, the member for Port Adelaide. Thank you and I apologise if you've given this answer during that uh, very hasty handover. Uh, but what is the uh, extent to which the SES uh, of the different schools is taken into account? Do you have a formula that you can share either now or or perhaps take on notice to explain what impact the variability of SES has on the growth, the likelihood of getting a loan. described to me as quite a complicated tier, tiered structure and uh, rather than uh, uh, try and unpack the analysis that goes into that spreadsheet, uh, which I'm sure the member would uh, uh, recall fondly Chris Bernardi is able to do at the drop of a hat, I'll take it on notice and see if we can describe it in, uh, in written form. Thank you. Chris going like that just behind <laughs> you for a second. <laughs> Member for Port Adelaide. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the, you've talked about AISA. I may have missed something again, but uh, is the Catholic se the sector schools engaged in this loan program at, the, at present? So the, um, we were talking about up to now, um, I have referenced the loans program earlier. Um, my understanding is that Catholic diocesan schools are uh, uh, encouraged strongly, shall I say, to borrow from uh, within the, uh, the Catholic uh, Church's financial sector. Uh, and so they have uh, not accessed either versions of the program. Uh, I, there are some Catholic non-diocesian schools uh, that have either uh, previously or are currently in the process. So there is some uh, level there to which the Catholic sector has been engaged and continues to be engaged in the loans program. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I think that the feedback I've had is that um, the Catholic sector has benefited from the loans program since its introduction uh, through encouraging more competitive rates from their other lenders, or uh, should I say, lender. Time has expired uh, for the examination of payments in relation.